individual, but it's 1 John 4, 14 through 16. Page 5. What was that? Page 5. Page 1 John 4, 7 through 13. Oh, page 6. Okay, page 6. Okay, page 6. Sorry. 1 John 4, 14 through 16. Still talking about the love of God here. I expect it will go in a different direction today than it did yesterday, uh, last Wednesday. And we have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in him, and he in God. And we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love. And he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. We know that there's no greater love than that which God has for his people. He proved his love with the sacrifice of his son on the cross. And his son proved his love for, his, for the father with his obedience through his life and death. Therefore, to dwell in God, we are required to live in and through the love with which he blesses us daily. Now, if you'll notice, it says there that his son proved his love for the father. Jesus loved the father so much that he died for our sake. God loved us so much that he sent his son. And it's God's desire for us to live, to dwell in that love. To recognize the extent of the love. I think Brother, Brother Pastor here the other day, he, he spoke of that kind of love when he spoke of his son. The love he has for his son. The love that a mother or a father has for their child is the greatest love that this world can know. There, there is nothing a normal parent wouldn't do for their child. For that matter, there, there are times when even abusive parents will go out of their way to protect their children from things that aren't themselves. They don't understand what they're doing, but they will not allow someone else to harm their child. God's love for us is far greater. And, and when we understand the love that God has for us, it should encourage us, regardless of where we may be, what we may be doing, Knowing that just as a parent supplies for the needs of a child, uh, a child doesn't worry about where their food is coming from, for the most part. I think there are outliers in every situation. But generally speaking, a child doesn't worry where, the, where their food is coming from. Right. They know that mom or dad is going to make sure that they have something to eat for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. They don't worry where they're going to sleep at night because they know they've got a bed that their parents have supplied for them. They, they don't worry about whether they're going to be cold or hot, it, it, depending on the weather, because they have a house that their parents have, have, have prepared for them. They don't worry about how they're going to get to the places that they need to go because their parents do this. We need to understand that that's how we need to look to God. Right. We shouldn't worry about anything. That's why Jesus on the Sermon on the Mount said, why worry? What, what benefit is it? The, the original Aramaic, I believe it is, Greek, and from translation anyway, uh, the original Greek says, who can make your life just a little bit longer by worrying? Who, who, it, I believe that it, it says increase their stature by a cubit. But the original Greek implies the cubit being a, a span on the sundial. Who can increase the, the shadow by one hour just because they worry? It, it doesn't work. But we have a God who supplies all of our needs if we simply look to him. And too many times in this life I'm talking about parents. Our parents weren't necessarily perfect. And so we have a tendency as humans to see God as our parents. When, when I see God uh, called Father in the Bible, the very first thing I did when I first came to the Lord was I saw God as absent. 
Because to me, that's who my dad was. He was absent. Come to find out, it wasn't his choice. It wasn't because he didn't love us. It wasn't because he didn't want to be around. It was because there wasn't anything he could do about it. Nick understands perfectly the situation of our father because he has kids that are so far away that he can't do anything about it. He, he doesn't have the wherewithal to go see them. But we have to get that thought out of our mind when it comes to God. Whatever it was, whoever it was that your dad was to you, if he wasn't a perfect father, that's not who God was. That's not who God is. God loves us as a perfect father loves his child. Like pastor said the other day, if someone holds a gun to his head, he's scared. If someone holds a gun to his son's head, they better be scared. That's the love that God has for us. That's the attitude that God has toward us. When, when we fail, he's not looking to destroy us. He's not looking to punish us. He's looking to lift us up and help us. He's looking to, to strengthen us, to, to help us to understand the damage that we've caused ourselves and help us to avoid it the next time. He, he showed it. I can't help talk about Peter and water, walking on water. He showed it to Peter walking on the water. Peter looked away. He, he stopped focusing his attention on what was important and immediately began to sink. Jesus didn't walk off and say, well, you're a failure. Too bad. But as soon as Peter recognized what he had done, he cried out. And Jesus was right there to lift him up. That is who God is to us as a father. 1 John 4. 17 through 21. Any thoughts on that? I don't want to take away anything if somebody has something. God is love, but when you think of C.S. Lewis just described it, because God, or love can't be from one person. Right. So the love that God is is the love between the Father and the Son. And if you explain it the way he did Yeah, he did, the he way did he a really good job. Absolutely. Oh, so can a woman forget her sucking child? Yea, she may forget, but I will not forget thee. God, though people could forget their own kids, God will not forget us. In the Old Testament, I believe it's right there in that same passage. It says, that they are graven in the palms of my hand. And I think about that, and I think about the male friends. And he was willing to suffer that for us. We are graven in the palms of his hand. He will not forget us. He will not forsake us. We may be going through that, but he hasn't forsaken us. He hasn't cast us off. I think about you saying that, Emperor Chris. Uh, it doesn't matter what we do. Right. Uh, I guess throw this out there. Uh, when Rick and I were talking a couple months ago, looking at the marker out front. I said, you know, I just really love to stand glass the bottom of that thing and get the person's name off of it. Uh, but the truth of it is, it's graven, it's engraven in that stone. Uh, I guess we could sand glass it, but it's not going to look as pretty anymore. It's going to change, it's going to alter the entirety of the marker. Uh, there's nothing we can do to change that because it is engraved in that stone. Uh, just the same we're engraved in the palms, as you said, of his hand. Uh, it doesn't mean that we can't backslide, right. but it means he's always going to be there for us. Absolutely. He's always going to love. He's always going to care for us. Uh, and we're always, we always have that father and that, that brother in Christ mm -hmm. uh, that we can go to, and they're always going to be there for us. Praise the Lord for that. We just think about the, the marker out there. Each of us has our own choices that we have to make. And each of us has been placed in the body as God sees fit at any given time. And it's our responsibility to find God's will and do it. If we fail, things may cause situations like we have with the name on the market. Right. But that doesn't mean that that, that individual is cast off the tournament. Right. They're still up. Uh, I think about... As you, were, as you were saying that, I thought about uh, 
Caiaphas and the Caiaphas, I can't remember which one it was, but one of them prophesied that Jesus was going to die, not just for the nation of Israel, but for all people, that they would be brought together in one. And, and I thought about that for a long time, and, and I realized that he was in that position by the will of God. God knew that it was just going to be a few short days and that same one was going to be making sure that Jesus was crucified. Mm -hmm. But at that point in time, because of his position as the high priest, God used him to prophesy. And what better prophet to show the truth of God's will than one who's getting ready to do the very thing that you would think you would not expect. That's what makes the, the word of God so believable. We have what's called hostile witnesses in the Bible. Those who are, who are most likely to go against the truth actually proclaiming it. Those who are actually most likely to try to destroy something actually building it up. But they, once again, think about Paul. Paul did his best, Saul, did his best to destroy the church. He wasn't in God's will. He, he was doing everything he could to destroy God's will. Of course, he was ignorant of that fact. And God used him to write the better part of the New Testament. And, and souls are, are touched to this very day by someone who was diametrically opposed to the will of God the first half of his life. So... Regardless of way, where we may find ourselves today, regardless of what we may see in our past that brings us down, we need to remember that, that God isn't looking to destroy us. He's looking to lift, lift us up. Uh, I talked about here recently, I think it was in Sunday school, about uh, Peter and Judas. They had choices that they made. They both made poor choices. It was God's will. It's not God's will that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That's what the Bible tells us. One had the, the same opportunity as the other to be reinstated, to be reunited, to be re restored to the will of God. But they allowed their choices to take them to the place that they went. That was their personal choice. It was God's will that both of them be restored. We have to recognize that where we fit in and not allow our choices to destroy what God, the good that God wants to do through us, whoever we are, wherever we may be, whatever it is that we, we may not have a clue. I still don't know what God's will is for my life. I'm standing here teaching a Bible study and I don't know what God's will is for my life. But what I do know is if I'm asked to do something, I want to do the best that I can because I know right now this very moment at 11 minutes to 8, it's God's will for me to be up here talking about the scripture, to be hearing your input on these thoughts. And that's all I can do. Right. I'm not worried about tomorrow, what God's will is for me tomorrow. I know that I have plans and things that I have to do tomorrow. But right now, is the only time that we have. And we need to make sure that every right now that God gives us is according to his will for our own benefit, for, for, for our own good. 1 John 4, 17 through 21. Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear. Because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. I want to stop right there. That's, that's one of my favorite and least favorite verses in the entire Bible. It's my favorite because it gives me hope. It's my least favorite because I still have fear. And if I have fear in my life, if, if there is fear in me, then I'm not made perfect in love. Which leads me to believe I need to get up there with Paul and press toward the mark. Right. That means I still have room to grow. That means I need to desire more of what God has for me. This verse is a litmus test to see where we are in our relationships with God, all of us. Now, 
in fearing death, we ran to the foot of the cross in repentance. But that fear in that situation will only take us so far. When we realize the, the great depth of the love God has for us, we will be able to rejoice in the knowledge that he's seeking our good. That's what I was talking about earlier about parent loving their child, no matter what that, parent, that child does. If that child, uh, <laughs> Brother Walters, his son ended up in jail for bank robbery. Sad thing. I don't, don't know his part. Don't, don't know anything about it beyond that. But Brother Walters never stopped loving his son. Right. Never stopped loving him. No matter what, he loved his son. When we realize the love that God has for us, and it's that same kind of love, not a confused uh, worldly love that, that doesn't understand how to treat their children right, because there's plenty of that in the world, but that pure godly love as a parent should love their child. God is always seeking our good, regardless of where we may be, regardless of who we may be. This, this not only should help us to understand the love God has for us, but it should give us a desire to have that same kind of love for the lost, to recognize as much as God loves me, he loves the guy who cut me off in traffic this morning. He, he loves the guy who uh, just killed that, the, those three little kids, killed their parents. Loves that guy. He loves, he loved Adolf Hitler. He was it Osama bin Laden? Osama bin Laden. He, he even loves Donald Trump. Maybe a stretch for some of us to believe, but it's true. He loves Joe Biden. He loves everyone on the face of this earth, regardless of the good or ill they've done. And he wants their good. And when we understand that, not only will we recognize, you know, I'm not perfect. I may not be as bad as Hitler compared to some people, but I'm just as worthy of death. I'm just as worthy of uh, eternal punishment as the, the drug dealer on the street, the prostitute, the drunk. Name your sin. I'm just as worthy of death. The only difference between me and any of them is that someone, God used someone to reach out to me and allowed me to experience the love of God. That passes understanding. Doesn't make any sense. Why would God love me? Why would God love me so much that he would send his son to die in my place? Doesn't make any sense. Why would God love all these men in prison? Exactly. He loves every single one. Once again, going back to, that's John 3, 17, that, that, that verse, uh, two of my favorites. It's not God's will that any should perish. Any should perish. But that all should come to repentance. In John 3, 17, For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Those, those two verses should go a long way in each of our hearts to, to help us, not only to recognize the love God has for us, but to allow that love that God has for us to be a blessing to those around us when God puts people in our path and says, hey, this is this is some, someone you need to speak to. Lord, just give me a thought. Said the Lord said that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, for God so loved those men in prison that he gave them my life to help them go to heaven. Amen. Not only remains up to us to seek the same good for ourselves by looking to him in all things. God wants good for us. God's not vengeful against his children. On the contrary, he seeks our well-being in all things and at all times. Now, he won't force us to make choice, choices according to his will, nor is he standing by waiting to punish us when we don't. But he will be there to lift us up out of the mess we've made when we understand where we are and cry out to him, just like Peter walking along. This kind of love should encourage us to trust him more in all areas of our lives. When, we're, when we truly comprehend the depth of his love for us, then we'll be able to love, to return that love to him 
without fear. And we'll be able to allow his love to flow out of us and into the lives of others. Let me go on there and start back in verse 19. We love him because he first loved us. If a man say, I love God and hateth his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother, whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? And this commandment have we from him, that he who loveth God loveth his brother also. I see brother here kind of the same way that Jesus saw a neighbor. It's not talking, I got my brother, I, I don't hate my brother, so I'm good, I'm, I'm, I'm fine. Now, I, don't, I wouldn't even minimize this and say, well, I love my brothers and sisters in the church. I don't hate any of them, so I'm fine. But I believe that John here is telling us any human. Here John reminds us that through God's love, we can have the boldness of Christ to spread the truth of his love to all those around us. In doing so, we should dispel all the fears which Satan constantly places in the hearts of all the inhabitants of this world. Fear can never accomplish what God's love is able to do. Imagine yourself driving down the road and the police car pulls out behind you. Uh, you may be a very conscientious driver. Nevertheless, you become nervous, even afraid that you might do something wrong. In fact, you fear the the fear you experience is actually likely to cause you to make a bad decision. And we can't think of God as bearing down on us, just waiting for his chance to send us straight to hell. Once again, it's not God's will that any should perish. Fear may have first driven us to the foot of the cross, but it can't keep us there. Fear can't keep us at the foot of the cross. That's, that's why I believe pastor showed a list of names not long ago, all the, the kids who are no longer in church. Fear was what kept them in church. And as soon as they had the freedom to make their own choices, they chose to avoid fear. Fear will only keep someone so long, but God's love has the power to help us to keep his will, to keep us in his will. Fear will cause us to avoid God, but love will draw us closer to him. We fear the, the consequences of not getting saved, and that drew us to the foot of the cross. But once we got up from that experience, we should have recognized the love that God has for us and desired to return that love to him. I've spoken of it before. I, I do things for women. Not because I don't want her mad at me, but because I love her. Well, I'll, if, if I do things because I'm afraid, I'm not going to do such a good job. I may, I may fall short. Well, I'm just doing this so she don't get mad at me. You did it wrong. I messed up. Now, it doesn't help. I'm just doing bare minimum. Just enough to keep above water. But because I love her, I go above and beyond. I don't just do a little bit to make it look like I've done something so she'll think I, I, I love her. But I go above and beyond because I do love her. That love gives me a desire to do more than what's expected. Uh, what, what, what do we read? That if we give ourselves as a living sacrifice, it's our reasonable service. We're not going above and beyond. Jesus said to the disciples, well, if, you've done, if you're a, a servant and you've done everything your master tells you to do, you're still an unworthy servant because you've only done what, what was expected of you. You've only done what was required of you. But when we love, we go above and beyond. We reach beyond what that, that minimum payment, so to speak, and desire more. What can I do? Not, not what, what is expected of me, but what can I do to be a blessing? What can I do to be a blessing to God? How can I be a blessing to God? What, what is it that God expects of me? Not because I fear what he's going to do to me, but because I appreciate so much what he's done for me already. If we slip and fall, 
We should therefore look to our loving God as a very present help in times of trouble. We, likewise, should reprove our fallen friends, family members, and colleagues in love, showing them our concern and not our contempt. Showing contempt will never win souls. It will only chase them further from God's truth. I, I've said it so many times, it's not even funny anymore. Going to hang out with my friends and ministers coming and yelling at me, telling me I'm going to hell. And then expecting that I should be interested in going to church with them that, that Sunday. That, that, that didn't do anything for me. That didn't give me a desire to serve the Lord. It didn't give me a desire to be in church. It gave me a desire to be as far away from church as I could. But there came a time when some of them came to me and, and they had compassion on me. They didn't tell me I was going to hell. They didn't, they didn't tell me how bad I was. All they did was show me love. That they showed me concern. Oh, what well, you need a ride on. Oh, I was going to get a coat for myself. Do you want one too? Just simple things. Little things. Just to show that they had concern for me. And after I realized that this person actually had concern for me as a human and they weren't looking to get something from me, they weren't looking to fill a seat in the church and, and get, a, get, a, get their offering bigger, but they actually had concern for my soul, that gave me a desire to know what was different about this individual compared to those that I've dealt with in the past who claimed Christianity but weren't bearing the fruit of Christianity. Any thoughts, comments? Probably wrap it up here. Right after. Anybody? Good stuff. I know I feel like there's a lot of good stuff out there nobody's saying. Anything. All right. One thing that really mm -hmm. helped me in the prison ministry is that though it was Thanksgiving, Christmas, you know, New Year's, my birthday, I was at the prison when I was supposed to be there and they they commented on it and they said that that's one of the reasons that they started opening up and fellowshipping and right. coming to it because they they felt the love and the dedication that I, that I was proving to them that I did Absolutely. love them and it would be win their hearts. And then that's that's all. I mean, we don't have to. It's not about spending a lot of money. It's it's not about um, necessarily healing, although that would be awesome. But it's just showing compassion. Showing, a, I don't know who said it, I know Brother Andrews used to say it, nobody, know, nobody cares how much you know until they know how much you care. And once again, when we look at Jesus and, and his ministry, that's, that's how he ministered. And if we expect souls to turn to Christ, that's, that's what we're going to have to do. Right. We're going to have to show them that same compassion that Jesus showed the lost. He didn't condemn, but he didn't condone. He loved them in their, their sinful state because he knew the path, the end of the path that they were on. And he knew that love was the answer. He knew that not, not to ignore their sins, but to show them the love that he had for them so that they would desire to have that same kind of love in their own lives and be able to share it with others.